Thank you. Thank you and good morning. So I want to share something with you today. Something that has made a huge difference in my life. Something that has made a huge difference in the lives of my clients and in their businesses. And something that has made a huge difference in the life of my daughter who happens to be the co-author of my book. She is a teacher. She is, I think, one of the best teachers in the world. Of course, I'm a little prejudiced. But at the same time, she has used this same theory that I'm about to share with you, this same practice that I'm about to share with you for the last 10 years. Helping freshmen, juniors, seniors, and even sophomores get to better places with their thinking. So what I'm going to do today is in 45 minutes give you the tool to change the way you think, the way you learn, the way you understand, and the way you communicate. And I'm going to do that in 45 minutes. How is that possible? Well, you need to understand a little bit about what I've been doing for the last 25 years. I admit that I am a consultant, a reformed consultant. But what I've done for the last 25 years is provide my clients with the opportunity to create moments of genius on demand and repeatedly. Moments of genius. Levels of thinking to which they would not be able to arise without this process that I'm about to share with you. And here's the way I've worked. I take a group of people, a team, who's been working on something for weeks, months, in some cases years, put them in a room, put them through this process, and at the end of the day I guarantee three results. The first result is that they will have achieved a consensus. The second one is that they will have achieved a vision. And the third is that they will have achieved an action plan, all in one day. Oh, and by the way, it comes with a money-back guarantee. If I fail to achieve this with a client, they don't have to pay. And I have to tell you, in 25 years, I haven't left one single penny on the table. How is this possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. Because for 25 years, I've been, without understanding it, I have been doing the equivalent of what people have done for thousands of years to achieve enlightenment. Levels of consciousness far above the norm. But I've done it in a commercial setting. It's taken me 25 years. How am I going to get you to the same place in 45 minutes? <laughs> that I can answer in one word. Algorithm. Now I think it's fair to say that most people would believe that an algorithm is something that belongs to computers. Something from the world of computers. But nothing could be further from the truth. Where do computers get these algorithms? They come from people. And what is an algorithm? An algorithm is a process, a set of steps you follow to get to a certain outcome. People invented algorithms. People invented programming for computers. Why? Because it mirrors and is a shadow of, to be perfectly honest, what goes on in the human mind, how our brains work. So how can you achieve, with an algorithm, moments of genius that are going to change the way you think you learn, you understand, and you communicate. We call this algorithm thinking whole. Thinking whole is an algorithm for creative, critical thinking. For individuals, for organizations, for teams. Now, when you use thinking whole, it can help you achieve personal, organizational, and team moments of genius. What do moments of genius help you to do? Well, they help you to think more productively, to learn more efficiently, to understand more concisely, and most importantly, to communicate more effectively. Our book, Breaking Genius, how you can use thinking whole to create moments of genius for your team, your organization, and yourself, is actually based on an explosion of thinking about how we think that's happened in only the last 20 years. This explosion involved people from all walks of life, disciplines, the Dalai Lama, monks, neuroscientists, psychologists, economists, people who thought about thinking the way we think in many, many different ways.
And that's part of the problem. So many different opinions, how do you take them all and turn it into something practical? That's what we have tried to do. But the beginning was actually a guy named Danny Kahneman, who in 2002 was given the Nobel Prize in economics. Now Kahneman is, and was, a psychologist. He was as shocked as anyone that he would have gotten a Nobel Prize in, of all things, economics. What did Danny Kahneman bring to the table? To put it simply, it is the theory that we do most of our thinking through one or the other, or in some cases both, of two systems. Thinking fast. Thinking fast is essentially intuition. It is explosive, it's instant, and it's immediately gratifying. Thinking slow is deliberate. It is thoughtful. It is calculating. What's the benefit and what's the difference between the two? Well, thinking fast, because it is intuitive, gives you the answer immediately. You just know. What's the downside? The downside of thinking fast is that you don't know how you arrived at that answer, which means you can't explain to me how you arrived at that answer, which means that you can't be sure that you could arrive at it again, and I can't be sure of getting to the same place that you got to. Well then, let's do the deliberative thing. Let's, let's look at numbers, let's calculate, let's think heavily. That's got to be much better. Not exactly. In the first case, research shows that thinking fast and thinking slow are roughly right and roughly wrong in equal measure. So neither is demonstrably better than the other. That leaves the other question wide open. Thinking fast and thinking slow are terrific when it comes to making decisions. Now what's a decision? Well, a decision basically is choosing between A or B, making a choice between discrete possibilities and alternatives. But there's a lot more that goes on up here in this very precious 1500 cubic centimeters of gray matter. Because what goes on here is different dimension than making decisions. We tend to be not only deducive, but also creative. We tend to be innovative. We tend to be and have the capacity, as I believe every one of us does, to reach genius. How do you get that marshaled? And by the way, that's the other problem with what Kahneman came up with. It's simply a description of what happens. What we've tried to do with Thinking Whole is give you a prescription of how to go about getting to interesting places. So, thinking whole is what we consider to be the third way. Thinking fast and thinking slow are great for making decisions, but you gotta have something else to get you to creative places. And that is the formula. Now, if that's the formula, then how does it work? Well, you know what? In every form of human endeavor, those who succeed, those who excel, they do so because they do three things. They learn, they, ex they exercise, and they master the fundamentals. There are fundamentals. There are fundamentals to how you hold a golf club. There are, how, there are fundamentals to how you swing a bat. If you learn the fundamentals, basketball, you will be very good. If you don't, you will not be very good, and you will be inconsistent. Now, there are some fundamentals very specific to the concept of the algorithm of thinking whole. They are three. There is the form, there is the focus, and there is a discipline. Now, if you master these fundamentals, then moments of genius are going to be readily available to you on demand whenever you need them. So what are the conditions of having a moment of genius? How do you know you had one? It goes like this. A moment of genius is something above and beyond the expected, the usual, and the ordinary. Number two, a moment of genius, once manifested, speaks for itself. Something entirely new and different suddenly makes so much sense that we should have known this before. That is a moment of genius. It is so right. And number three, a moment of genius must leave behind a tangible, meaningful artifact. Something that inspires, something that energizes, and something that guides. We believe that moments of genius should cause something to happen. They are not the end-all and be-all in their, in their selves. Now, this 
algorithm, this approach, this thinking whole process, has worked for senior leadership teams. Senior leadership teams even in Fortune 50 multinational companies. It's worked for creative departments in advertising agencies. Can you concept, can you see that concept? An algorithm, a process for creativity that actually improved the creative output of advertising agencies. And finally, most importantly, it's worked with my daughter, which means that it works in a classroom of 14 year olds. And it's gonna be kind of a challenge. If they can master thinking whole and get to better places with their thinking, what do you expect? What can you hope to achieve? I'll give you an example of how it's worked for the kids and what it might do for you. This is the result of something that my daughter tried to teach to her class. It's a complicated concept. It's called the tragedy of the commons. It's about social working together, society. Very complicated for 14 year olds and they weren't getting it. So she whipped out thinking whole and in short order not only did they come to understand, here's an example, one of them said, oh my God, wait, this is what we read about the other day. This actually makes sense. That happened in a very short order. But more importantly, because of the way that Thinking Whole works with teams, they actually taught one another. They got to their places collegially, collectively. What a wonderful place to be. So how does Thinking Whole works? The most important thing about thinking whole is that it is used to quiet the mind. I don't know if you think about this very often, but the truth is you cannot not think about something. It is impossible to still your mind to the extent there nothing is in it. Your mind constantly tries to think about something. That's what it's for. Think about something all the time. Think about the many things that you think all about the time. Think about all the things you're concerned about all the time and you suddenly realize that you can't really focus on any one thing. You can't really coagulate, coalesce and crystallize your thinking. So thinking whole basically requires, and as I said, three things. The form, the focus, and the discipline. What is the form? Well, the form basically is our answer to this. I may not know the answer to your question. I may not know the solution to your problem, but I can show you exactly what it looks like. Look at this form. This form actually serves to get people to think more expansively, to think in a way that creates new possibilities, a way that opens doors to moments of genius. This is the form as it actually functions. The form is made up of a top funnel and a bottom funnel. One closes down, the other opens up. And in the middle is something really significant. Here's the way it works. The form on the top requires seven significant facts and three propositions to make sense of anything. I'm going to repeat that. You only need seven significant facts to understand anything. And here's why. The truth is that anything after seven is not, you, not something you're going to remember. Research has proven conclusively over and over again that nobody can make sense of information beyond seven ideas. That's why there are seven telephone digits. AT&T figured this out a long time ago. So you need only seven significant facts. By the way, as far as we have come to understand, it is neither more nor less than seven. When we work with groups, typically what happens is we ask people to start talking. We list down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When we reach seven, there is no eight. That is to say, if somebody comes up with another idea, we don't throw it away. We just say, okay, there are only seven spaces. Those seven spaces are precious. And if you have a proposition that makes the number greater, we have to figure out how to get the number back down to seven. Seven is the magical mystical number. It works. I don't really understand why. I don't propose to understand why, but it does. Okay. Seven significant facts. By the way, there can't be fewer than seven because that simply means you haven't really thought about it. So it is a discipline that at once limits the number of choices. That means you have to make really good choices. And at the same time, it also insists on having seven choices. So there's a push me pull you that gets you to think about the significance of the facts you're talking about.
Now to make this more meaningful, you have to take the seven facts and bring them into something that gets to some level of actionability. And we believe that is the three propositions. Three propositions that are drawn from those seven facts and create a kind of space. The propositions are at once comparative and yet competitive. They are different aspects that together point to a whole. And what's the whole? The whole, in this case W-H-O-L-E, right, is what we call the central operating principle. Not an aha, not an answer, not a solution, but a central operating principle. By the way, the words operating principle are very important. We believe that meaningful making sense of information leads to actionability. What good is information unless you can do something with it? advance something with it, create something with it. So, so the central operating principle is derived from the seven facts and three propositions and it points the way to what comes next. And what comes next is a reversal of the numbers. Right? A reversal of the numbers. What we now lead to is three strategies that come from the central operating principle and then we come up with seven executions that make those strategies real. And that, my friends, is the short story of thinking whole. So let's do a quick summary. What happens at the top of the form is actionable inciting, getting to insights that actually mean something and can have an effect on what you do next. The next step is focusing on the operating principle, the COP. Every good project needs a good cop. The central operating principle. Because the central operating principle tells you what you do next. That leads to what we call actionable inciting. C-I-T-I-N-G. By the way, inciting something is not a bad thing. From the original Latin, inciting simply means to hasten the happening of something. So actionable inciting turns the central op operating principle into strategies, that become executions, and voila, you're there. Now, we said originally that there's a form of focus and a discipline. What is the focus? It's a well-known fact, you know it yourself, that often in meetings when people come to understanding something, they keep talking. They keep talking and they keep going on and on and on and on and they lose their way. How do you keep your mind on track? The form shapes your thinking. The focus, which could also be considered a mantra, is something that keeps you on track. Remember I said there our minds wander. Our, our minds wander. We start thinking of more possibilities. You know why we wander? Because our brains reprogram themselves every millisecond. That means every millionth of a second, our brains are reprogramming completely based on what we're hearing, what we're seeing. How do you keep on track? with the focus. In our case, it's very simple. Okay, if, if we were Buddhist monks, we would focus with a mantra as simple as Om, Om. That sound reverberating through your skull actually makes it possible for you to focus on one place. Remember, clearing your mind is not possible. Focusing on one thing is the best we can do to still the mind. Um, in our case, the focus, the ma I'm sorry, the, yeah, the focus, which is also the mantra, is 73137. 73137. It becomes like a marching order. If you use 73137, if you keep focusing that everything comes out at 7137, you'll be surprised at how well it works. Some of you may have read the book, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in that book, there is this wonderful scene where a supercomputer has been running for millions and millions of years to, to tell you what the, you know, the, the, re the meaning of life is. And it, one day it stops and it starts spitting out an answer. And everyone stands around waiting to hear what is the meaning of life? What is the truth of the universe? The computer cranks up, the printer starts running, and all of a sudden, out comes the solution. On the page are, is written 42. So the secret of life is 42? Well, perhaps, yes. 
we know that the secret of life, the secret of thinking, the secret of thinking whole, the secret of creativity and moments of genius is 73137. And that leaves us with the last part of thinking whole, the process. That is what we call the discipline. Because like everything else in life, there is a discipline that you have to use. It is practice, and there's some little secret. As we said in golf, it might be something as simple as move your thumb over a little bit. Follow through. Disciplines that you have to just learn. And what is the discipline that is necessary for thinking whole? It's actually incredibly simple. In order to think whole, what you have to do is learn to think out loud. Think out loud. What does that mean? In most meetings, most people say things because they just want to say things. They don't really examine what they say. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. When I'm running a session, I say the unexamined speech, unexamined ideas have no place on the board, which is limited to seven spaces. So thinking out loud is really very simple. I said before, our brains reprogram constantly, immediately. If you actually listen to what you're saying as you say it, if you listen and hear each word and see how that word connects to the next one and allow your brain to make those connections, then what you're going to say at the end is different than what you would have said at the beginning because it has been perfected by allowing your mind to make it perfect. So thinking whole is listening to what you're hearing, listening to what you're saying, hearing it, and allowing your mind to connect it to everything else. That's why you end up with great ideas at the end. So let's do a summary here. Thinking whole is an algorithm for creative, critical thinking. Using thinking whole can help you to achieve personal, team, corporate and organizational moments of genius. And what do moments of genius do for you? They can help you to think more productively. They can help you to learn more efficiently. They can help you to understand more concisely and communicate more effectively. The end game of thinking whole is understanding things well enough to be brief. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes to go and exercise on your tables in the back of the room. There is an instruction sheet. I want you to do what it says in the instruction sheet. You have 10 minutes to do it. And in the remaining time, we're going to actually put it to work so you can see how thinking whole works. Okay? Thank you kindly. We'll see you in time.